I'm really pleased to be here with you and to participate in this series of discussions with journalists on key trade issues. Uh, you mentioned I'm the editor in chief of Trade Vistas. It's tradevistas.org, by the way. Um, and it is, I, I want to mention it is a nonpartisan, non advocacy um, online publication uh, dedicated to engaging the public on how trade affects their lives, their jobs, their communities, the nation. Uh, and to generally make trade policy more accessible to non-experts. And it is also sponsored by the Heinrich Foundation, I should mention. So I'm grateful for their support as well. So the title of this program is What's Next for the WTO? Um, and I, one of, one of my other hats that I wear is that I teach at Georgetown, the master's program in foreign service. And I've done that for the last 15 years. But what I realized a few years ago was that you can't just teach the students what is because you assume that that's what they're going to inherit in terms of trade policy and uh, trade policy institutions. Instead, you really have to teach them how to innovate, right? Trade policy is an exercise in creativity is what I say to them and what I believe of being a trade practitioner. Um, and what we're facing right now in the WTO is a kind of stasis, right? The state, it's not serving the, the, its members well, it's leaving them to want to negotiate deals outside of the institution or to take measures outside of the WTO. Um, but it also means that the trade rules are falling too far behind the modern global economy in areas like services and digital. Um, and the rules were negotiated before China's entry and they seem at this point inadequate to deal with China's pervasive state involvement in its own economy. So to move forward and to get to what's next in the WTO, I think you have and anchor yourself in founding principles, which is what you asked me to talk about. Um, and I wanted to start with this polling because very few Americans are familiar with those principles, let alone how the WTO operates. So at Trade Vistas, we did some polling in July. Um, and the reason that we decided to do the polling, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this, but the, the implementing bill, the bill to implement the WTO in the United States, it, it allowed for um, the Congress to assess the value of U.S. participation in the WTO every five years. So um, anyone, in, a member in either house, can offer a joint resolution of disapproval to effectively withdraw the United States from the WTO if enacted into law. Now, you'll see if you read it, the, procedurally the deck is stacked against, you know, a vote actually taking place, so it doesn't seem very likely, but um, the timing this year as you all will know, it coincided with the U.S. withdrawal from the WHO, which is one letter off as far as the American public is concerned, even though very different organizations. But um, I felt like the risk was higher than ever before, given the level of public distrust in generally in international institutions and in public institutions in general. So we wanted to know what ordinary Americans thought about the WTO. So you can advance this and I'll show you some of the results here. We asked if there was support, if people supported or opposed leaving the WTO. And the result of this was that 36% supported, either strongly or somewhat supported, leaving the WTO. But another 17% were indifferent and 18% were unsure. So another 36% here were indifferent or unsure. So I sort of put you know, these two numbers together and suggest that really only 28% of the respondents had either strong or even tepid support for staying in the WTO. So there's clearly an opening for detractors of the WTO. But optimistically, at least I like to look at it optimistically, when people feel that they understand the role of the WTO, they were, they're more likely to be supportive of it and more supportive of US membership in it. So for example, when you frame it as enforcing voluntarily agreed rules, or as preventing foreign governments from being unfair to American businesses, the majority of people responding believe it does play that role. So if that's true, and you can go to the next slide, and if it's also true that most Americans, upwards of 80% of Americans, believe the US should lead the global economy, it's play that role. 
Here's where it gets a little bit shaky again, though, because among those who think we should leave, you know, their answers tend to align with their belief that they, their, their earlier response that we think they think we should leave the WTO. So they don't think leaving diminishes our ability to leave. But 31% didn't think leaving would make a difference or they were unsure. Only 23% responded that it would hurt the U.S. standing. So I think, you know, these are not shocking or surprising numbers necessarily. Um, but I think what it shows is there isn't necessarily a groundswell or a strong movement to leave the WTO. Mostly people are unsure of what it does, right? They're unsure of the value proposition. And that includes the younger respondents, which I think is, is troubling. And it's, it's a key audience for us at, at Trade Vista. So I think it comes down to how do we help the American public and the global public understand um, the organization, what the agreement is about, um, and would that understanding reduce the general distrust toward the WTO and other institutions these days? So I think you could take those slides away. And I, what you asked me to talk about substantively now was what the WTO does um, and what we can't go through every aspect of that. I know people are probably familiar with its core functions, with dispute settlement, with negotiations, um, with its monitoring function. Um, and each is important, but what I wanted to focus on was the basic contract of the WTO, right? The foundational principles, the core elements that I think if the general public understood better and they would have faith that it aligns with our democratic free market philosophy and they might be more inclined than to support it. So I'm going to go through five, very quickly, five core elements. and. You know, they're all, they're, they're prevalent in the founding principles of the WTO, but you will find this in every free trade agreement. Here are the five things. One is procedural fairness and transparency. So the WTO has requirements for governments to consult with stakeholders on regulations and laws that affect people doing business in their country, to publish its regulations, to make them known, to be transparent in their processes. And we take those procedures for granted in the United States. Um, but I think what's really underappreciated about the fact that they're embedded in the WTO and you have you know, 194 members adhering to it is the significant pull through. These are best practices and it helps promote rule of law in the commercial arena in other countries. So this sense of procedural fairness this is the, the pull through of that is what enables traders around the world to do business overseas, right? To feel that they can do business overseas. They know what the rules of the game are. The other element here is non-discrimination. You've heard that a lot, but it's vital. What the WTO stands for and what's embedded throughout its rules is the principle of non-discrimination in two different forms, right? One is that, that members won't discriminate against imports from other, from countries, from any country. So if I have a cell phone from South Korea, same cell phone from China, I won't discriminate among the, between those imports. But I also won't, so national treatment is the other principle. I won't offer better treatment to, to uh, American companies, for example, than I do importing, uh, uh, companies that are importing. So national treatment, providing the same treatment to, for, for domestic products and services that you provide to imported is a, an element of non-discrimination that is core to the WTO's operation. So if you overlay market access on those two things, the procedural fairness and the non-discrimination, then what you have is that those principles are applied in regulations and also to different forms of market access, procurement, tariffs, the ability to provide services. So market access is the third key element of what the WTO, what governments agree to as part of the WTO. I think the fourth one that's also overlooked that's really important to the way that Americans and others perceive the organization is that it has always built, been built in from the beginning of, of GATT and WTO that there are exceptions, right? There are exceptions for reasons of national security or to protect human health, plant health, animal health, or to protect exhaustible natural resources. And in those cases, there may be some type of discrimination necessary to achieve a legitimate public objective. But there are disciplines on that too, right? It has to be done in, in the least trade restrictive way possible, for example. 
So if Americans worry that international institutions threaten sovereignty, um, it's, it's true that we voluntarily agree to procedural fairness. It's true that we agree to provide market access on a non-discriminatory basis. But you don't give up your right to regulate. And if there's a conflict, you can avail yourself of those exceptions when it's necessary and appropriate. So the last one that I want to touch on is just enforcement. Uh, this is just a very detail, but a great deal of what I just described ends up enshrined in domestic law and practice. It's, but it's, it's strongly normative at this point. That's another really underappreciated point is that the rules about procedural fairness, non-discrimination, governments take that into account when they're developing regulations and implementing laws. It is largely normative and that is a huge value of having the WTO operating in the background. But you also have the ability uh, to pursue a violation through enforceable dispute settlement. And that's a key element of the, of the WTO that is unique to the WTO among international organizations. So there's a lot more I could say, but I know you wanted me to stay at the 30,000 foot level. So I'm going to leave you with just those five points. But I want to just make a transitional point at the, here, which is to say that you know, the orientation that I just described, this procedural fairness, transparency, openness, reasonable exceptions to, to this generally free market orientation, um, and adherence to a binding contract that we entered into voluntarily and that's for mutual benefit. If all of that sounds like the orientation generally of the United States, it is. <laughs> so that is the key point, you know, for Americans is that, is that the WTO really does reflect the way we operate, the way we do business. So if you're going to make a case to the American public, I think you have to point out that the WTO aligns with American goals of protecting fundamental economic freedoms, of having transparent rules and basic you know, disciplines for basic fairness. So if it's faltering or failing to keep pace, we have the ability to negotiate necessary improvements if we demonstrate leadership. And then that would protect, you know, our own ability to control our destiny. So I know if, if all that's too amorphous, um, the other point you can make to Americans is that it provides a counterpoint to China, right? And I know we're going to get deeper into that. Um, the WTO promotes and spreads this commitment, right, to free market and democratic ideals. China stands for something other than free market democratic ideals. So it really comes down to who will influence most the rules of this system. Um, and I think that that, you know, that's a, trans um, that's a transition. I'm going to tee that up now for uh, Bryce and Jennifer to talk about, you know, the, if it's Trump too or if it's Biden. Um, when you view the WTO, a lot of this is going to come down to, do you let it go fallow and become an instrument um, for the Chinese government, or do you engage and negotiate and reform it? So I'll leave it there and we can continue the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Andrea, uh, for that um, a really helpful nuts and bolts introduction to why we should care about the WTO. Um, and um, journalists out there, I'd just like to put in a um, mention that Andrea is a wonderful source in her ability to explain very, very complicated issues um, in English. So um, her Twitter was in the invitation and you feel free to reach out to her um, when, when the going gets uh, really hoary there. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Jennifer. Um, Jennifer is, uh, as she will tell you, is an informal uh, an advisor to the Biden campaign, but has agreed to come on in her personal capacity. So nothing she says here is, um, you know, connected to the Biden campaign. But we're really grateful to have her because she is um, such an expert and a veteran. And um, I'd just like to mention that she's also um, appeared um, a number of times before to brief journalists at the uh, National Press Foundation. And uh, you're her. Uh, her previous videos, as well as all the resources from this program can be found on our website, uh, nationalpress.org. You'll find Andrea's articles, as well as Jennifer's previous um, uh, videos and uh, some of Bryce's coverage as well. So Jennifer, thank you so much. Over to you. Well, thank you, Sonny. And, and it, it is, is really a delight and an honor to be here and to follow on Andrea's, I think, very, very crisp and clear presentation. I also really do want to join her in thanking the National Press Foundation for all it's doing to try to build understanding uh, around these, these very complicated trade issues. So I do want to talk a little bit about what's going to happen on the trade policy front 
either if uh, President Trump were to be reelected or if there were to, to be, be a Biden, Biden administration. administration. But as Sonny noted, I want to be very clear that I am in no way speaking for the Biden campaign. What I would reflect is simply what Vice President Biden has already said, um, either when he was the vice president or on the campaign trail. And similarly, anything about the Trump administration, I'm drawing from the president's actual words or, or actions. Um, so what should we expect um, if uh, Trump is reelected? I think the answer is mostly more of the same. Uh, which, which means, means at least four, four of, the of the following, I think, think important, important things. things. First, First, I think, I think what, what you would see is a continuation of and possibly additional unilateral tariffs. And when I say unilateral tariffs, I think it's important to understand that that means that they are illegal under the WTO's rules. I, I, think, I think you, you can, can see President Trump has repeatedly described himself as the tariff man. Um, and has also repeatedly said, and I would note erroneously, that somehow it's foreigners that pay for these tariffs, when in reality, tariffs are paid by the American importers that are bringing the goods in. But there's no question that President Trump likes and favors trade tariffs. So I think we can expect more tariffs, uh, despite the fact that I think in my view, the tariffs that we have in place have not done what they were purported to do. They have not made our steel or our aluminum industries more vibrant or improved our national security. They have not brought about significant change in China's unfair trading practices. And because they violate our WTO obligations to charge no more in tariffs than we agree to in our tariff schedule, um, they are promoting a, a sense of kind of lawlessness and chaos um, in the trading system. I mean, at its very core, for example, the United States agreed through a series of negotiations to charge a tariff of no more than zero percent um, on imports of steel. And yet one of the first acts that the Trump administration took uh, was through the result of this national security investigation to start charging a 25 percent tariff on all steel imports. So, again, an immediate notion that we're that the Trump administration favors tariffs even when they're not legal, uh, even when they're imposed in this unilateral way. I think the second thing we could expect from a Trump administration is a continuing disdain for multilateral organizations, including the WTO and for multilateral rules. Uh, I think if you look at it, the president has threatened on and off that the United States would withdraw from the WTO. Hence the reason I think that you see this in Andrea's polling, um, that there has been this consistent threat of we need to pull out of the WTO, that the WTO has somehow been unfair to the United States, that the WTO has failed. Um, I think the president continues to say that he, he will or may withdraw the United States, notwithstanding the fact that it would take an act of Congress to do that. He's clearly made it clear that his view is that the United States is better off with a might makes right sort of power based trading system rather than one that's based on rules. Uh, to me, the truth is that we need the WTO and its rules based system for a number of reasons. But the two most important ones um, are I'm going to I'm going to piggyback on what Andrea has said is that it protects American goods farm products, services, intellectual property rights from being discriminated against in foreign markets. No one can decide that they want to impose a higher tariff or bar American goods just because they're American. I mean, you can't just say, OK, I don't like uh, America for this reason or that reason, and therefore I'm going to put restraints on American goods. Secondly, um, to me, uh, the WTO provides stability and predictability to everyone. Among, to me, the many problems with the Trump administration's policies have been the uncertainty of them. No, no one, one knows, knows whether tariffs are going to be imposed, whether there's going to be um, exclusions from the tariffs granted or not, whether, whether changes, changes will be made. And everyone, therefore, has less confidence to make long-term contracts or investments. Um, and, and these decisions often disrupt trade by imposing tariffs on goods that are already on the water, already under contract before you even knew about it. The third thing I think that you can expect from a Trump administration is the continuation of approaching trade largely through bilateral or unilateral approaches. Um, and that means fundamentally smaller trade deals that are not nearly as comprehensive um, as, a, as a broader multilateral agreement might be. And secondly, this going small, going unilateral means that the U.S. will continue to cede leadership, uh, particularly to China.
Um, while you've seen some cutbacks recently from China, China is unequivocally moving ahead with its massive Belt and Road Initiative and its efforts at regional trade agreements through RCEP and others, and by ensuring that Chinese nationals have prominent roles in the WTO and other multilateral organizations. And fourth, I would say with respect to the WTO's dispute settlement system, a Trump re-election means a semi-permanent end to the WTO appellate body and with it to, I think, the binding rules-based system. I think ever since May of 2017, when the United States began blocking the appointment of new members uh, to sit on the appellate body and extensively outlining a lot of long-standing U.S. concerns, our trading partners have been asking the basic question, is the goal of the United States to reform the appellate body or to destroy it? And I think this summer we've gotten a very clear answer. For the Trump administration, the goal is to kill the appellate body. Um, I think you see the response of the rest of the world is both great frustration with the United States and a decision to move ahead without us. So you've seen 22 countries, including the EU, China, Canada, Mexico, others, form what they're calling a multi-party interim arbitration arrangement to try to do this notion of appeals um, under an arbitration process, uh, which again has a lot of great potential, but fundamentally um, doesn't bind countries like, like the United States that refuse to be a party to it. So what would change if there were a Biden administration? And again, I wanna remind everyone, I'm not speaking for the Biden uh, campaign, um, but I would think you would see at least three very significant changes. First, I would expect a Biden administration to support a reformed WTO and the rules-based system that goes with it. Um, I would expect a Biden administration to fully engage in the process of reforming and revitalizing the WTO, including its dispute settlement system. I think you hear very clearly Vice President recognizing the critical role that the United States has played, both in forming the WTO at its, at its beginning um, and his desire to work with allies to confront China, and that means including through the WTO and the WTO dispute settlement system. I would imagine the Biden administration to also use the WTO as a key forum to work with allies to achieve agreements on a number of the critical issues that are pending before the WTO right now. And that includes everything from getting disciplines on fishery subsidies that are leading to overfishing and depleting our oceans, uh, to new global rules governing e-commerce and digital trade, but also to use the WTO as a place to pursue his objectives of including protections for workers, for the environment, and for public health in a broader trade agenda. I would also see a Biden administration using efforts to reform and revitalize the WTO as part of its work to dampen the amount of chaos that we're now seeing um, in the trading system. Secondly, I would expect the Biden administration to, re to, to really emphasize a recognition between a linkage on investments at home and trade policy abroad, with Vice President Biden already making it clear that he does not favor new trade, trade agreements, agreements until investments are made in infrastructure, technology, and training so that American workers are given the tools that they need to compete in the 21st century. I think you've clearly seen Vice President Biden's statements on that, and it is a recognition of how out of step the United States is with much of the rest of the developed world. I mean, if you look, for example, at the amount of long of spending on long term worker training, investment in our workers, uh, in worker health care, in worker training, in worker development. Most of the rest of the OECD countries spend between two and three percent of their entire GDP on that long-term worker support. In the United States, the number is 0.27%. We simply are not investing in our workers or giving them the tools that they need to be competitive in a globalized trade world. And I think that is one of the clear things that where I think, think you would see a change between the Trump administration and, and a Biden administration. And the third big change uh, that I think you would see if Biden uh, administration were to come in is work to restore trust. Um, in America that has been lost under President Trump. I, I think very few of our trading partners believe that they can trust us. I mean, if you look at it, the ink was hardly dry on the USMCA before President Trump threatened to put new tariffs on all, all goods coming in from Mexico over immigration issues. I mean, if we look more recently, 
less than a month after the USMCA entered into force just this July, the Trump administration reimposed tariffs on aluminum coming in from Canada. Um, and it required an enhanced monitoring of steel exports coming out of Mexico. If you flip to looking at what's happened with China, um, when the initial 301 reports came out saying China is to be condemned for its theft of intellectual property, its forced technology transfers, and at some level for the sort of subsidies and state-owned enterprises and a lot of other unfair trading practices, the rest of the world agreed with the, Uni with the United States that we were right. But what did the Trump administration then do? They went and cut a deal um, that at its heart simply says, all you need to do to get out of this China is buy more, more American, American goods, $200 billion dollars worth more, more of American goods, goods which, which basically, basically means buy less of everybody else's goods. So immediately the rest of the world is sort of set aside, pushed away from uh, this idea of joining with the United States to go after China. So. So again, I, I think the broad message from a Biden administration would be to work to restore that kind of trust. At the WTO, um, in particular, I think you see the U.S. has put forward a number of proposals, some of which were even begun under the Obama administration to alter the notion that countries can self-declare themselves to be developed developing countries in order to get special and differential treatment. You've seen the U.S. put forward proposals on transparency and the need uh, to, to make countries be accountable to their requirement to provide um, notifications of everything from subsidies to trade barriers. Um, but the proposals have been greeted with some degree of suspicion about whether the United States is really out to undermine the WTO, uh, given its singular willingness to, to take down the appellate body with no plans to, to fix it or to engage in it. So I think a Biden administration would work very hard to restore faith that you can take the United States at its word and that when the United States puts trade proposals on the ta table, it's doing so in good faith to restore a better trading system for all. So while there may be a lot of overlaps, uh, I think at its core, the approach of a Biden administration versus the Trump administration would be quite different. And you see that most directly at the WTO in the notion that I think a Trump administration has had little faith in the multilateral system, whereas I think a Biden, Biden administration, administration believes first and foremost in working with allies, with multilateral institutions, and fundamentally a belief in a rules-based system. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for that excellent um, wrap up. Uh, I want to just tell people who are joining the call late, because I know we had a bit of a Zoom um, problem this morning, that this is being recorded. It will be up on our website at nationalpress.org, and we will also have a transcript. Um, so if you missed the first part, uh, not to worry, and there will be plenty of time at the end uh, for questions and, and debate. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Bryce Bashuk, who's joining us from Bloomberg in Geneva. Um, Bryce has been really tearing up the turf there, and a lot of uh, people in the trade world depend on his um, reporting. So first, we're going to ask him to um, explain the very confusing um, standoff uh, failure to be able to um, uh, select a new uh, leader for the WTO and what's next. And we'll discuss that. And then after that, journalists on the call, we're going to come back to Bryce for his tips about how to be awesome and how to uh, best cover this if you are a US-based reporter who now suddenly needs to uh, get smart about what's actually going on in Geneva that didn't used to matter and now you need to know. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over. Bryce, thanks so much for joining us. And great uh, great Swiss view there, by the way. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, Switzerland's a tough place to be stuck these days. It's, uh, the view is not too bad. Um, I really appreciate you uh, including me on this panel uh, with experts like Jennifer and uh, Andrea. Um, this, is, uh, this is an honor and, and, and thank you very much. Um, just going to kind of give uh, my insights into what's happening here in Geneva. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk uh, about the chaos that the organization, uh, it certainly has slid into dysfunction, uh, especially over the past three years. Um, Andrea was talking about the three primary functions, dispute settlement, uh, negotiation and trade monitoring, and uh, almost all three of those are pretty much frozen. Uh, some work happens here, uh, but it's uh, certainly not operating on all cylinders. Um, so thrown into that, you know, sense of dysfunction uh, in July, or sorry, in May, uh, the Director General, uh, who is the uh, foremost official at the WTO, decided that he would step down from his post a year early 
um, he cited uh, reasons that he just really uh, was ready to move on um, and uh, today starts his job at uh, PepsiCo in, uh, in New York. So um, with all this dysfunction, we now have a leaderless organization. Uh, members in July were unable to agree on an interim uh, director general. So there is, it's literally a leaderless organization, um, which um, is not particularly problematic because there wasn't too much going on here uh, anyhow, but it's not a good uh, thing. Um, there are eight candidates who have thrown their name into the ring to be the next uh, director general. Um, they started uh, their campaigns uh, in July, um, came to Geneva, introduced themselves to the delegates here, uh, answered questions uh, about their ideas for reforming the organization um, and about their background, uh, and then faced uh, the media as well. It was a pretty fast and furious week, and, and we got to know some of the folks who want to help uh, steer this sinking ship. Um, <clears throat> At the uh, end of the Q and A, um, there was a, a sense that the two of the candidates who uh, are, are likely to, you know, garner the most interest uh, are, are two African women, uh, Amina Mohammed from Kenya and uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwala from Nigeria. Um, now, uh, a selection process uh, to basically winnow down these eight candidates uh, will officially start this month. Um, the candidates are still campaigning. They're going out and uh, talking to uh, capital level officials, basically explaining you know, how they hope to uh, reform the organization and answering any questions that, that, that officials may have. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer has met with all the candidates, um, and uh, he is not saying a word about which one he prefers. Uh, in fact, you're going to see a lot of that from some of the higher level uh, uh, officials in Europe, uh, Asia, and, and the US, they, they won't say who they want because um, that could actually be uh, detrimental to their uh, favorite pick. Uh, the reason for that is um, decisions at the WTO are made on the basis of consensus. That means that all 164 members have to agree in order for something to advance. And uh, on the flip side, any member can oppose any uh, candidate uh, for any reason whatsoever. Um, so uh, that has resulted in this dynamic where um, you'll see the candidates uh, interviewing uh, in, in uh, newspapers and they don't really say anything particularly newsworthy and that's intentional. They, they, they are very, very careful to not wanna upset um, the major players at the WTO. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the United States and uh, China. Um, so, uh, that's, that's kind of the state of play there. Um, beginning on September 7th, um, there is a group of WTO officials called the Troika. There are three individuals who hold the highest ranking committee uh, chairs. They are going to uh, hold a series of confidential meetings with delegates to uh, talk about uh, which candidates that uh, nations believe will garner the most consensus uh, to be the next director general. Um, this is a totally secret process behind closed doors. Uh, none of the information is intended to get out. Um, the idea is to basically protect the dignity of uh, the candidates who will be slowly whittled down into three phases. Um, we start at eight. Um, after this first consultation, it will be uh, three candidates will be cut or asked to step back, um, leaving five. Another three candidates uh, will be uh, asked to step back from the race, leaving two, and then members will uh, be faced with the decision of which final candidate they want to select to be the next director general. Uh, the expected timeline uh, for that decision is November 7th. Um, however, uh, that's not set in stone, and um, there is the small issue of a US election in between now and then. So uh, things may be extended, um, it's right now, it's about as clear as mud. Um, uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, why this is important for uh, countries like the United States and China. Um, I, I believe uh, uh, Jennifer alluded to the idea that um, the US and China are in a bit of a turf war in international organizations. Um, both are trying to put um, uh, officials at uh, high level uh, international organizations 
that they feel would best represent their interest. Uh, the Chinese have been doing this uh, somewhat successfully for years. They have three heads of international organizations, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, uh, the FAO, and the International Civil uh, Aviation Authority. Um, the U.S., uh, the Trump administration has uh, sought to counter that. Um, this year, they successfully displaced a candidate who is seeking to be the leader of the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is just up the road from the WTO. And um, I, I, I think it's safe to say that the U.S. would want to have a candidate at the WTO that best represents uh, Robert Lighthizer's vision for fundamental reform, uh, for addressing China's excesses, and uh, the third uh, condition he has is they can't be any Amer uh, anti-American. Um, so, so that's kind of uh, the state of play here in Geneva and uh, why it means uh, uh, so much to the U.S. and China. Uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Bryce, I, I would like to just ask one question uh, at the beginning, and that sure. is, um, so uh, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer recently wrote a, a piece for the Wall Street Journal in which he laid out kind of his, his vision for reforming the WTO. Um, is it your sense that if the United States, and I understand this is a big if because there's gridlock with China, if the U.S. were to prevail and get its preferred candidate, whoever that person actually is, um, through, whether it's a Biden candidate or a Trump favorite candidate. Um, what do you, how would you rate the, the WTO's ability to actually enforce fairly in this very messy landscape to enforce trade rules? In other words, it's one thing to have a head um, that is that is perhaps favorable, or even if the U.S. and China were to strike a deal uh, uh, over the new head, it's another thing to actually have an enforcement mechanism. You cover this. How would you rate the WTO's ability to, to be an effective uh, enforcer of whatever is agreed upon? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I, the Director General of the WTO um, is, is, uh, is not, it, it actually doesn't have that much power. It's not like being a president or a prime minister. Uh, it's more like being a maitre d' at a restaurant. Uh, the, the WTO uh, is run by its members. There's 164 nations. They uh, set the agenda. They discuss negotiations. They settle the agreements. And the Director General's role is really more to facilitate that. Uh, he or she can, you know, organize meetings among members, can make statements in the press, and, uh, you know, if there are disagreements, occasionally they can use their good offices to try to address those um, in a way that, you know, is amenable to everybody. So, so that said, um, the next director general won't really have much power to settle these kind of massive uh, geopolitical disagreements we're seeing play out at the WTO. The, the U.S.-China trade conflict will not be settled by any of uh, these director generals um, as, as, as qualified and as experienced as they may be. Um, having uh, uh, a, a good listener and someone who can help rebuild that kind of trust that, that uh, Jennifer was talking about, that's really the kind of qualities that, uh, that delegates are looking for that kind of basically set the stage and, and, and kind of decompress a lot of the uh, uh, rhetoric that's, that's, you know, we've seen in the past three years. Okay, well, thank you so much. So one last question, uh, everybody, please uh, put your, uh, get your questions ready. You can put them in the uh, Q&A. You can also upvote or downvote questions you most want answered on Zoom, and you can raise your Zoom hand um, if you want to be called on on the air. Um, we're going to give preference to journalists, but we have lots of times for questions. I want to just ask one last question um, of Andrea, and uh, I guess Andrea first, and then and also um, and then Jennifer. So uh, Bryce has described very ably um, an opaque process and organizational drift, which you know we presume is going to go on for a while, at least until ac after the U.S. election, possibly longer. Um, who benefits from the current state of organizational drift? Who wins from good luck? <laughs> Well, I think that's a pretty easy question, actually. Um, to me, the, the winner is China. Um, look, I think, you know, Bryce pointed this out, and I, I don't think it's too stark to say that China is working to remake the international organization landscape in its own image to exert um, a high level of influence. And, you know, Bryce described a few of the organizations that um, China is now the head of. It's unprecedented to have one country head that many economic oriented international institutions. Um, and if you look at the suite of those things, um, you mentioned civil aviation, you mentioned telecoms, 
um, but also something called the Industrial Development Organization, the UN Industrial uh, or Development Organization, as well as the FAO. So when I look across this suite of, of institutions that they're now heading, um, I see that they, it, it aligns really well with a desire to you know, secure access to resources, to exert influence in developing countries, and you don't have to spend, you know, the treasury of, of China, you don't have access to the funds of these international organizations, and also to shape the global regulatory environment in key areas like the civil aviation, the telecommunications, um, and, and boldly went after, you know, WIPO, the intellectual property organization. So I think that that is, it's very, um, it's very strategic. I think it's, it's, it should be now fairly obvious um, to us. Uh, I don't think that the membership is going to support, uh, you, you know, a direct Chinese candidate in the WTO. But um, the idea to me, I think that the goal would be for China to kind of neutralize the impact of the WTO's ability to constrain its own approach to economic growth and to intervention in its own economy, right? So if, if there's stasis, if there's a lack of, of agreement or ability to move forward, that means that there also won't be necessarily new disciplines in the area of, of subsidies, disciplines on its approach to state-owned investing in its own and directing its own state-owned enterprises. Um, and that is clearly to the benefit of, of the Chinese government. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, Andrea, we're getting a lot of questions. I'm going to give the first one, uh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I'm going to give the first question to you um, sure, sure. on, um, uh, this is on the Appalachian body re uh, overreach. So right. um, the uh, questioner wants to know um, what's going to happen uh, if Biden wins on some of these questionable decisions like the introduction of the stare decisis doctrine, interpretation of the term public body, constant advisory opinions, among others. And I'd just like to mention that um, for those who are joining late, that uh, Jennifer Hillman's briefing on the appellate body itself is available on our website if you need background so that you can understand the answer she's about to give. Jennifer, thanks. Sure. Well, um, clearly a lot of what the U.S. has been complaining about have been complaints that have been brought for a long period of time. Uh, so it isn't, th these did not start with the Trump administration. And so my view is they will not end with the Trump administration. I mean, uh, the Obama administration, uh, so that means the Obama-Biden administration started, uh, again, this notion of we really have to push back on some of the things that the appellate body has done that the United States uh, thinks is not in contravention with at least the understanding of what the appellate body was supposed to do. So the issues themselves are not new. Um, what, what is new is that the Trump administration has taken it to this extreme position of saying um, we're going to block all appointments to the appellate body such that the appellate body no longer has enough members to decide any cases. So it's effectively shut down the appellate body system. Um, that did a, a, something really important, which is, I think, bring everyone in Geneva's attention uh, very clearly on the U.S. complaints. I mean, in other words, for the first time, really, I think all members of the WWE started hearing it, uh, that there were this serious complaints. Out of that grew a process to try to address the United States' reforms, um, headed ultimately by Ambassador David Walker from New Zealand, who put together a whole set of sort of, if you will, new operating principles that the WTO could the appellate body could live by uh, that would go a very long way to addressing the United States' concerns. The problem was at that point, the United States sort of disengaged in the process um, and basically didn't really react in, in, in any real substantive way to those Walker principles or to the rest of the process, um, and it basically just stayed out of it. So again, we now come to this view that the United States um, on the one hand, has, if you will, legitimate concerns um, and that there has been a legitimate effort in Geneva to address them, but the United States is now taking this position of sort of, uh, you know, nothing is good enough. We simply want to kill the system. Uh, so uh, where this is headed, I think, again, it would depend on, on the results of the, of the election. I think a Trump administration will stay where it is, which is we simply want to kill the appellate body. We don't want an appeal system. We don't want a binding dispute settlement system. We want to be able to block um, any results that we don't like.
Um, I think without a recognition that if you do that, so can the others. In other words, when we win cases against China, China can do the same thing, block the, the adoption of the reports. So, you know, again, I, I think it will take serious engagement. And again, I think at this point, the world was willing to engage with the United States. How long the rest of the world will be willing to now stay? I mean, in other words, how long will this leverage that the United States has created last? I think is, is hard to judge. I mean, Bryce may have a better sense of that. But I think, you know, going into this Walker process, there was a lot of leverage um, and a lot of willingness by other countries to hear the United States and to try to figure out a fix. Um, I don't know whether there, that will still be the mood in Geneva of we need to fix the appellate body or whether the creation of this multi-party interim arrangement, everyone is going to sort of move over to saying, well, let's just do it through arbitration and leave the United States out. I think that's, that's a little bit hard to judge. Uh, again, I, I think if nothing happens, the U.S. will have squandered uh, a significant amount of leverage that it created um, and a significant amount of engagement by the rest of the world to really hear the United States' concerns, I, I think will we'll, we'll go by the wayside. Um, we have a question from um, a reporter, Kat Lucero from MLEX. Um, I guess this one may be for you, Jennifer, but uh, Andrea, you may want to weigh in. If Biden becomes president, how likely would the EU and the US be to settle the Boeing Airbus dispute at the WTO? Leaving aside China for a minute. <laughs> right. um, well, I, I, again, I, I don't, again, this is obviously a hugely longstanding dispute. Uh, and there have been multiple efforts at multiple times across this entire uh, set of, of disputes to try to figure out a solution. I mean, for those of you that don't know, this is, this is a longstanding uh, complaint where the United States is saying the entire creation of Airbus and the launch of every single new model of Airbus airplane is unfair uh, because it was all done on the backs of very significant subsidies granted by Germany, France, uh, the United Kingdom, and Spain. And so there is an, there's an argument that trade in subsidized goods is unfair because it's asking the United States to compete against goods um, that, that are unfairly subsidized. And of course, then immediately the Europeans turn around and say, oh, wait a minute here. Boeing got um, a whole series of subsidies, largely through uh, research and development and military contracts, where a lot of the technology from everything from, you know, quieter landing gear to different kind of fuselage constructions, et cetera, came out of research money uh, granted to the military side of Boeing that, that can then transfer over uh, to the civilian side of Boeing aircraft, along with a number of other subsidies. So the argument is, you know, Europe is saying, United States, you unfairly subsidized Boeing. U.S. saying, you know, we uh, that Europe unfairly subsidized Airbus. Long, long, long dispute. Uh, but I think at its core, um, I, I do think um, there is a recognition in the Biden administration of while this whole long fight has been going on, what has also been happening is the Canadians, the Brazilians, and the Chinese have been developing their own aircraft industry. So while we keep doing this bilateral fighting, everybody else is winning by being able to, again, develop their very large uh, aircraft industries as well. And so I, I think the understanding is by far the best solution to all of this is to get everybody together to agree on a more global agreement on exactly what, where, when, and how much um, can one subsidize the production of aircraft. Um, and if you could come up with, again, a broader agreement of an understanding of exactly where the limits are, uh, that would be a far, far preferable approach. Um, how likely is it? I think it's, it's still got to be in the unlikely category, uh, given how longstanding this dispute has been. But I think that would be more likely an approach that a Biden administration would want to take. Um, Bryce, one question, quick question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to some of our international um, uh, folks on the line. We've got people uh, registered actually on this call from 33 countries, I'm told. So that's, I think, a new record for NPF. Um, but I'd like to go back, Bryce, the question coming in, I think, for you is, um, so who is China supporting uh, in, the, uh, in the race for director general? Or are they also um, being mum about it so as not to trigger U.S. animosity and U.S. rejection of their candidate as well? That's an easy question. I have no idea. And they're definitely not going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, China, just like the United States, they, uh, I, I think if they put their uh, endorsement on any one candidate, it's the kiss of death. 
you're going to get a veto from you know the other nation so you, you won't hear mom from either of them okay thank you so much um all righty i'd like to turn it over uh, open the line to muhammad khan who is calling in from pakistan muhammad can you unmute yourself thank you uh, sonny and the question that i have is uh, uh, regarding china's uh, ambitious uh, belt and road project so a uh, huge investments in not only central asian republic and Afghanistan, Pakistan, but also in African countries. So that economic leverage that China is going to get is also likely to turn into, you know, its support uh, in terms of uh, returning alliance of the companies uh, of the countries from uh, maybe uh, previous, previously in the Western back uh, U.S. block towards uh, uh, Chinese block, uh, for example, Iran. Uh, Syria and a uh, number of African countries and Central Asian republics, Pakistan, Afghanistan. So what do you think is uh, going to be the future of this Belt and Road Initiative and its uh, flagship project, uh, CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor? And uh, is it going to be something which is uh, hugely successful for China? Or uh, it is something which is uh, not going to pose any danger to the Western bloc or to the U.S.? Thank you. I mean, I, I can start. I, I, I think um, uh, it's too early to tell uh, which way this is going to go. Uh, there's no question that the Belt and Road Initiative is, is very huge, uh, both in terms of the dollar value, in terms of the breadth um, of, of what it's attempting to do, in terms of, you know, I, I, if you look at it, sort of more than 80 percent of the funding so far has gone into infrastructure like transportation and energy. Uh, so it is the the creator of the roads, the ports, the the uh, energy facilities um, in in its many many countries. And again, there is a huge swath of of the world that is in some way connected into the Belt and Road Initiative. So in that sense, I think this is China stepping out onto the world stage in a very big way and trying to show you know its command of of the ability to do a lot of this. And at the same time you're starting to see a number of pushbacks um, in a number of countries. Uh, a, there's a lot of concern about the level of debt. I mean, most of the lending that is being done for these projects is being done on relatively significant commercial terms, which means these countries are taking on a significant amount of debt. Uh, you're starting to see some, some defaults, some pushbacks, some concerns over that. You're also starting to see some complaints about the quality of the, of the process and of the actual construction that's occurring. So again, whether it ends up leaving China looking really good at the end of this and, and creating this very large sphere of economic power and influence, or whether it leaves a very bad taste in countries' mouths, uh, depending on how the projects go, I think it's a little, a little too early to tell. Uh, certainly the early indications are that that many countries are in desperate need of this kind of infrastructure spending. Um, it has clearly created a bit of a push or tension um, on you know, the World Bank, the IMF, and on other countries' um, developmental lending to try to figure out what's the appropriate response for the rest of the world uh, to think about it. But it has given China an entree into places that it has not been before. It has given it connections uh, that we haven't seen before. And, and I think the question speaks to how, how dangerous this could be, and on the other hand, how, how helpful a lot of this infrastructure development may be to a many, to many uh, countries that are in much need of it. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we have a question from Argentina, um, Julieta Zelkovich. Excuse me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Uh, Julieta wants to know if Biden were elected, um, will these hard topics like agricultural market access or fishery subsidies gain momentum in negotiations? Andrea, do you want to take that one on the specific sectoral uh, battles that we're seeing now raging around the world since you've written on some of these? Yeah, I don't know that this is necessarily a um, you know, a Republican or Democrat, it, the reason for, you know, the, the inability to move forward, I don't think has a lot to do with it, you know, with who's, which party is in power in the United States. It spans such a long period of time um, that it really has more to do with, um, you know, the, the, the political economy of trying to negotiate this stuff in general, right? So you, um, there are always extreme sensitivities in certain sectors, in fisheries and agriculture, no matter which sector you look at, there are always extreme sensitivities in these. They're hard to negotiate. 
I do think there's, you know, a dynamic that's developed over the years in the WTO that's really unhelpful, um, which is that, you know, in, the, in, in Doha, for example, there was, it was the tail wagging the dog in terms of trying to negotiate. So this, this dynamic between um, who's developed, who's developing, therefore, what kind of flexibilities can I take? How long can I take to implement? You know, all of these dynamics of, of how can I get out of the commitments before I even know exactly what my commitments are has been, a dyna I think, a dynamic that's plagued the negotiations in, in every sector for 20 years now. So we've got to figure out how to break that dynamic. Um, and I don't think that it's, it's a party issue. I think that's something that just bold leaders who can articulate and try to get the countries participating in the negotiations to really focus on the end goal and the benefits of liberalization and agree on that, agree on a set of commitments before you start figuring out what flexibilities might be needed to implement. Um, that's a question of, of political will, of leadership, of good communication, and um, not really one of politics, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, Bryce, while we've got you, this is a question that will come up in our next uh, webinar, uh, our next program on September 22nd on national security and data. But while we've got you, I have a quick question about um, the um, TikTok and WeChat dispute and how that, that might play out at the WTO. Uh, could China file uh, a complaint against the US uh, at the WTO for blocking uh, or you know forcing the sale or blocking um, these these companies and if so um, I granted it would take a long time for this to work through the process with the gridlock but would there be in your view um, you know PR value do you expect to see China appearing at the WTO and complaining about um, U.S. Um, blocking uh, of Chinese investments on national security grounds? Sure, good question. Um, well, that's two questions. The, the first is, could China do this? Yes, China could do this. I, I believe uh, they, they are considering filing a dispute. Um, I think the grounds would be this would be a violation of uh, national treatment, whereas the U.S. is favoring uh, its uh, technology companies over uh, Chinese technology companies. Um, Will China file a dispute? I don't know. That, that's where this whole uh, debate about uh, the, the effect of the appellate body blockage um, is, is affecting uh, how countries um, address trade disputes. Um, China knows uh, that if it wins a dispute against the U.S., all the U.S. has to do to make it go away is to appeal it into a legal void. So it will have spent three years, uh, I don't know how much money, uh, on lawyers in Geneva debating this issue uh, to get a result which will essentially not help them at all other than just say, hey, look, we were right. Um, so they, they could do that. They could file a dispute just so they have the, you know, a, a ruling uh, that, that could potentially favor them. I don't, I don't know if it would favor them. Um, but at the same time, they could address this in a bilateral fashion and same in much in the way that the U.S. has done uh, with intellectual property disputes against uh, China. It, it has filed unilateral um, measures through Section 301 of uh, U.S. trade law to basically impose, skip the whole WTO process and then go straight to the, uh, to the sanctions. So uh, you may see a, a dual effort there right now. I think it's too soon to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, journalists, um, we've got just a, we're ending shortly, but we'll take a last round of questions. You can put them in chat or raise your hand. Um, we've got one last one. Um, question for the panel from um, Alistair Scarf, head of country risk for Bank of America in the Asia Pacific. Um, this one is on India. Can you comment on India's role and behavior toward reforms at the WTO? Is India being a fair and reasonable stakeholder? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> That's a pretty broad question. Andrea, you want to, do you want, do you have anything to say on India's behavior? Well, I, you know, I, I'll leave um, the on the ground observations to Bryce because I haven't been in Geneva in a while, but I, I, I will say that in general, I think that what should be on the table in discussing WTO reform and what a next DG needs to do is to really look at the way the WTO operates. Um, it's wonderful that we have been able to operate largely on consensus uh, for a long time, but on this, by the same token, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't allowed us to make significant progress in the negotiations. And 
uh, we've seen that, you know, a vote of one, uh, you know, an objection by one, and, and that is often India, um, has really stymied the ability to reach some significant agreements over the years. And I, I, I just wonder whether it's, um, uh, it's, it's time to look at other ways of achieving progress in the WTO, at least under some circumstances, if not for everything, um, would there be a reasonable, you know, situation where it would be reasonable to go with the majority, to take a vote, to do things a little bit differently so that one country, um, which is just so happens to often be India, <laughs> can't block progress for everybody else. Okay, well, thank you for that. All right, I'm going to turn this over for to some uh, to Bryce for some on the ground uh, help for journalists, since we are the National Press Foundation. Our motto is we make good journalists better. Um, so Bryce, we have a lot of people uh, covering this for the first time. Um, we have a, a thank you for the background about um, you know what's going on at the WTO and the race that's coming and the organizational drift. What advice can you give? Uh, U.S. and Asian correspondents, people who are not in Geneva, um, for how to how to report better on these issues, and um, how to explain these things to uh, to the rest of the world um, in the way that you've been uh, able to do so well. Sure, I, I think uh, a key to this beat is persistence. Um, it is a uh, very secretive organization. A lot of the meetings take place without any sort of announcements and there won't be you know, too many readouts that are very detailed. If there are developments that are negative, that's not something this organization likes to broadcast in any way. Um, so uh, a key to covering this beat is, is really shoe leather journalism. Uh, unfortunately, you really do have to be here in Geneva to cover it very closely. If, if you're not in Geneva, um, I would say the best tips uh, I, I, can, I can offer are you know, uh, sign up uh, for the WTO uh, press newsletter. Uh, make sure you're in contact with their press shop, which is fantastic. They, they have a great team there. They're, uh, they're very honest and candid, and, and, and they will walk you through what is a very detailed and technical uh, organization. I, I, I really recommend reaching out to them. They have a great team. Um, there is a, uh, a resource that the WTO has um, called Documents Online. I would, I, if you know how to set a news alert, I would set an alert. So you get a, you know, a, an email anytime that their new document pops up. Uh, it's a great way to uh, learn you know, what exactly is happening at this moment, what issues members are focused on. Um, you're not going to get a lot of news out of it, but every now and then there's a, there's a gem. I think another great resource I would recommend is the uh, Geneva-based International Trade Center. They have a really fantastic um, uh, what's called a trade map where you can really boil down the data as to which countries trade, you know, what products and, and where global trade flows are headed and, and what tariff rates are. It's, it's just really a fantastic resource and, and they too have a great press shop if, if you want to reach out to them. Um, I think um, other than that, uh, reach out to your local uh, uh, ministry of trade or, or, or foreign uh, affairs. Um, they are really, really great resources. These people are very smart and uh, know I've been doing this for years. And um, I, I would say when you interact with these folks, um, just you know, be really honest and candid. Say, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Can, can you explain to me what's going on? And um, I, I've always been surprised at how helpful uh, um, um, government officials have been in terms of catching people up. <laughs> 